So today's webinar is on the subject of reverse engineering cheese. It's um, really, instead of troubleshooting to find out problems that have occurred in cheeses that you are making, the uh, actual presentation today is more about trying to figure out how to make a cheese that you want to make but don't know how to develop the recipe for it. So it's a process that we're gonna go through to uh, figure out how to make a cheese that we think there might be a good market for or that we just would like to make for the challenge of making it. The first thing we wanna do is analyze the cheese. And in this way, we use sensory evaluation of the rind and the interior, the paste of the cheese. We're looking at all kinds of things uh, when we do this. Before we even start and cut the cheese open, we're gonna look at the size and the shape of the cheese because those factors are actually very important in terms of how that cheese ages. For example, the cheese on the top of this stack here is a softer type cheese of a tome variety that we make here. These are our cheeses that we make here at Parish Hill Creamery. And it is a cheese we wash with hard cider to develop a, a really delicious kind of paste and a unique rind. Um, it does not age all that long, maybe four to five months to get the fullest flavor. And after that, it's not as good of a cheese as it was in that time frame. And so therefore, it has a shape about the size of a brie, about kind of like a quick brie, weighs about four pounds. Whereas the cheese on the bottom, which is an Alpine style cheese, an Asiago uh, style that I developed, it weighs about 30 pounds. And you can see it's more like four to five inches thick. And it's a, uh, a cheese that's very durable and can age for well beyond a year because it won't dry out and uh, lose its important characteristics. It'll actually mature as it ages from a uh, just a delicious cheese into something that's got crystalline type texture and, uh, and then becomes more of a grading quality cheese. So right here we can see how important the size and shape are to the ultimately the flavor, texture, of the cheese. And then we're also looking at how hard the cheese is. And then we're looking at the rind to try to understand how that rind was created. The size and shape determine the aging potential. And that is a really important thing to remember. The camembert on the left is a around an eight ounce cheese, 450 grams. It's only an inch, a little over an inch thick and it's about four inches in diameter, and um, it's only gonna be uh, on the shelf up to about 50 days before it gets too ammoniated and strong for most people to eat. Whereas the cheese on the right that I've got up on end that I, I used to make at a different uh, cheese making farm is a, another Asiago style cheese and it's a cheese, the one I'm holding was actually about a year and a half old. So that was about a 30, 35 pound wheel. And right here we can see again, I'm just reiterating how important it is to understand the size and the shape of the cheese before you set about to make it. Next we'll move on to the texture and flavor. And here we're really looking critically at um, at the texture first of all, before we even take a bite. We wanna understand if it's got, like the cheese on the top, if it's got small eyes in it, or you know, even just a few big eyes, or a lacier texture, or what, you know, this kind of open texture it's called, maybe with some mechanical openings, not just gas bubbles. We wanna understand um, where that came from. So is it the milk itself? Is this a raw milk cheese that we're looking at? Or was it a pasteurized milk cheese where specific cultures were added to promote carbon dioxide development? What kind of feed went into the production of the milk for the cheese? Because sometimes the feed will play a role in how much 
carbon dioxide is produced during the uh, aging of the cheese. Maybe the temperature uh, was raised during the aging to promote that kind of open texture and that the eye development um, in, in certain cheeses, especially your Swiss varieties. That's done on purpose. Gas producing bacteria are known to work better in lower acid conditions. So when we see cheeses like this, we can be pretty sure that the, the make process did not involve raising the acidity to a high level like in cheddar making uh, or maybe blue cheese making. Um, and so uh, um, we're going to be thinking about uh, the use of starter cultures along with this first look at the cheese. Everything that we're going to be uh, incorporating into the recipe, we're trying to uh, imagine how those ingredients uh, are used and uh, what they are. And we look at the texture again, we can see uh, how supple it is or an elastic it is versus how cakey and friable, like crumbly it is. So, and, you know, very ends of the scale of, uh, of, of uh, texture, we've got um, um, a kind of a crumbly cheese versus a cheese that's very stretchy. And so when we, we find the cheeses that are more crumbly and acidic, uh, those typically are, are made with mesophilic starter cultures that work very well at room temperature. Whereas the cheeses that are made to, to have a, a fair degree of elasticity and suppleness are usually made with thermophilic cultures, or they may, the curds may be washed during the process of making the cheese to lower the acidity to provide that kind of texture. And then we get down to the bottom of this slide and we get to the uh, runny or what I call pudding texture type cheeses. And these are just cheeses that are very, very high in moisture. And we can see how important it is to have some sort of uh, packaging that, that keeps the cheese into a form versus letting it spread out. Because as it ages, it becomes so soft that the rind can't even hold it in, in, in a lot of cases. So, so these, these cheeses could be made with a variety of of cultures, uh, even mixing mesophilic and thermophilic together. And um, we really have to try to uh, think about um, where that cheese started as a young cheese that might be more helpful. Uh, so it might be a good idea when you're doing the uh, reverse engineering to find a younger version of this pudding type textured cheese to see if it's, if it is more elastic, supple, or, or if it's more cakey and, uh, and uh, like a fresh chev kind of texture. Moving ahead with, with some more, uh, some more uh, looks into the texture and flavor. I am not moving ahead here with my slideshow. There we go, okay. So, we look at harder type cheeses that have granular and crystalline type textures like a, like a well-aged Alpine cheese, uh, a uh, aged Gouda, Parmigiano type cheese, Romano type cheeses. Then we know aging time is important because we just don't uh, have the uh, experience in young cheeses of, with this texture unless for maybe the temperature was extremely high, we might get that crystalline texture from the proteolysis occurring in a younger cheese, but that wouldn't really be uh, something we would want. That would be more like a defect. So we're, we're here looking always at good examples of the cheese we want to make. We wanna make sure we, we, we go to, to a cheesemonger that we, we get our cheese from, that we trust their ability to to buy great cheese and take care of it. And that's where we want to get our samples from. We want to get a fairly good sized piece so we have a pretty good idea of about these sensory characteristics. So with the, the uh, cheeses that have the more dense and crystalline textures um, developing, typically we don't have a real high fat content in the milk. So that gives us an indication that maybe the milk was 
standardized, meaning that the, some cream was removed to alter the ratio of protein fat. And moving ahead to more texture and flavor, we start to get those fungal and mushroom notes. We know that some kind of uh, mold or uh, yeast, perhaps, but probably more like a mold culture was was used or was allowed to grow in the rind to create that kind of flavor. Sweeter and milder flavors tend to come from the use of thermophilic cultures or curd washing when mesophilic cultures are used, like in Gouda cheese making, for example. If you want to compare Gouda cheese to cheddar, that's a really good example of what curd washing will do because the, the recipes actually aren't all that different except that the Gouda cheese employs a uh, culture that produces carbon dioxide for the small eyes in Gouda. But other than that, they're pretty much made at the same you know, level of moisture and the same uh, kind of uh, steps in the cheese making process uh, up, and up until the curds are drained from, the whey is drained from the vat. And that curd washing is a really uh, strong step that can influence texture. When we go to, uh, to experiencing the, the flavor uh, further here, and we get the nutty and kind of savory, meaty kind of flavors, brothy flavors, we can be sure that um, lactobacilli bacteria are in the mix, and uh, their enzymes are breaking down the proteins in the milk to create those flavors. So... Uh, also, the propionic bacteria, when you have a cheese with eyes like the one on the bottom, right, you'll, uh, you'll be pretty sure that the propionic bacteria are in this cheese, and so you may need to, to add them as a culture. Sharp, picante type flavors. That can occur, and, and you know, and at the extreme, really strong biting flavors, which, you know, a little bit of that in some cheeses is certainly what some consumers look for. They like that sharp edge. Uh, I would say that um, that's most profound in Italian style cheeses. It's part of the flavor profile, and it's called picante. And that just means that there's some butyric acid in uh, in that flavor, and that's what you're tasting. It could be propionic acid also if that gets produced at a higher level. And that those are very distinctive type flavors that kind of makes your mouth, your tongue tingle. So when you're uh, you're you're looking, you're you're tasting that kind of, of cheese, then you can be pretty sure that lipase enzymes would have been used or maybe a paste rennet, a rennet that contains lipase enzymes naturally would be used in the manufacture of that cheese. And, but also um, it could be due to um, the feed that went into producing the milk. So when you have uh, silage type feeds, you can get higher levels of these uh, free fatty acids just because the bacteria that tend to harbor, um, that the feed tends to harbor these bacteria that, that uh, have uh, uh, the ability to produce those free fatty acids at a higher level. So this can also help you, again, I mean, it's, we're kind of doing a thing where we're, we're looking at how to develop a recipe, but we're also getting some indications into what maybe when you, you, know, you have a, a flavor that's a little over the top that you don't really quite like, and you think, boy, I'd really like to solve that. Now we're we're actually troubleshooting as well as we go through this presentation. So you can use both, you know, ideas uh, out of this presentation, developing a recipe or helping to solve some defects. Peppery and spicy flavors. There's no doubt that the only way to get at those are through using goat and sheep milk. Think about some of the fetas from Greece real Greek feta, it has to be made from sheep milk. They only allow up to 20% of the milk to be goat milk, and all the Greek feta has to be made from goat and sheep milk, and that's for specific flavor in the cheese. There are other cheeses that, you know, there's no other way you can make them unless you use goat and sheep milk. So you can, you can try adding some lipase to a cow milk to, to promote that kind of development of flavor, but it'll never be quite the same. That's because the original milk itself has got different proportions of the fatty acids, and that's what the fats are made out of. So 
when those get broken apart later on during aging, then the true f flavor of the cheese is expressed. And uh, so, you know, instead of banging your head against the wall trying to make a cheese that, that uh, from cow milk that tastes like uh, a sheep cheese or a goat cheese, then, you know, you can just get a better understanding of, of how important the milk is uh, to the fundamental process of making the cheese. We get these kind of zesty and piney type flavors like cedary sometimes. And, uh, and that's, that's because of the blue mold. It, it, um, it, even when it comes in as a, uh, a contaminant into a cheese, like a cheddar, for example, it's usually, it usually makes a nice tasting cheese because it adds a little bit of that um, zippy characteristic to the flavor. And so uh, uh, this gives a little window into the uh, um, process of making blue cheese too. Like the more over the top that kind of flavor is, probably the earlier the cheesemaker needled the cheese to allow the blue mold to start developing inside the cheese versus when you, you taste a cheese like Stilton, for example, um, which I don't find nearly as, as uh, overpowering with the blue zesty kind of flavor. Um, that's being needled much later in the, in the aging process, like six to eight weeks after the cheese was made. And that has a big, big effect on how the flavor develops in the blue cheese. So you can get a bit of a sense of, of when they might have needled that cheese to introduce the air uh, by the actual flavor of the blue cheese. But it's really important to understand with blue cheese making that, um, that it's, it's about the time that you're trying it because blue cheeses evolve quite a lot. And most of the blue cheeses that are on the market here in the States are around three, four months old. And, uh, and so it's kind of uncommon to have a blue that's really overpowering um, unless, and that could have just been sitting in the shop too long. Whereas blue cheeses that, that are older, you know, six months up to a year uh, before they, they really get strong towards a year, those would be blue types of blues that were needled later during the aging process, not after a week or, you know, just a, a short time, but the cheesemakers would have waited several weeks before they needled it. And the cheese would mature first uh, without the blue veining. And finally, on the bottom, we have an example of an aged Gouda, and that's the sweet kind of candy-like flavors, like the butterscotch and all that. And that's generally, you know, when you're, you're trying cheese like that, you can just tell by how dense it is and how uh, it's kind of flaky and it's, uh, it's very, uh, it's got like a little bit of cheese has a, a lot of flavor that will give you an, uh, a pretty good idea that that cheese has been aged for a long time. And this is the good thing about knowing your cheesemonger. I mean, always try to find out how old that cheese is you're tasting that you, that you want to make. And that way, instead of being unhappy that after a year, you don't have the flavor that you thought you would, uh, you know, because you might have found out that, oh, well, I actually have to wait two years. So trying to get this information is really important. In addition to the sensory evaluation, getting the information is very important. Finally, we're going to take a look at the body and the rind of the cheese. And here, uh, Body, we're always talking about the hardness of the cheese, and that relates directly to the ratio of protein to fat in the milk that we started with to make the cheese. So um, the lower the, the ratio is, then the softer is going to be the cheese. And the higher the ratio, the harder the cheese. That's the way it works. Um, secondly, we, we know uh, that the more the moisture is removed as whey, the harder will be the cheese. So there's uh, often these combinations of, of cheesemakers standardizing the milk to remove some cream to raise the ratio of protein to fat, plus cutting the curd really small and with a high cooking temperature to make the cheese as hard as they want it to be. It's usually not so much the aging time, uh, 
it's usually more about the first two things. But aging time, of course, becomes a big deal when you're taking a hard cheese and you're getting to that quality when it's just really the flavor is super intense and it's gotten to be more like a grating quality cheese. And you can be sure that that cheese has been aged well beyond a year. And finally, we're looking at the, the rind of the cheese. And this, uh, this cheese on the bottom is a, is a nice example of a washed rind cheese where salt water was used. And, uh, you know, really cheese, cheese rind development is so complex that, that uh, it takes, it really should get some good books and start to read, read better or go work with cheesemakers or visit cheesemakers that you know are doing this kind of cheese aging and just find out about all the different things that can be done to uh, create the diversity of rinds of washed rind cheeses because cheesemakers and, and cheese aging specialists, the affineurs, will be using um, solutions that, that will contain various levels of salt. They'll put in ripening cultures, perhaps. The, they may just be washing with, uh, with booze. They may be cutting the booze with water. There's many different um, kinds of washed rind cheeses. And the temperature and relative humidity are super important. There's, a, there's kind of a fine line with these cheeses where if it's too dry, it doesn't get going very well. And if it's too humid, it gets to be too much growth on the rind. So there's these really narrow uh, ranges where you want to be. It's usually, and temperature will promote uh, rind development. So that has to be held in check. Uh, but we know that the bacterial type rind cheeses, which this is an example of, they tend to benefit from higher uh, temperatures because then we get more of the proteolysis going on. So what we're looking at is a fairly high temperature in like the mid 50s and, and pretty high relative, or quite high relative humidities of 95 to 98%. And this is where all this happens. And it's, it's not a long time. It may be just a month. And then that rind gets developed very well. And then the cheese can be moved to different conditions. But then there are also hard cheeses that have these washed rinds that are kept in these conditions for a much longer time because of the lower moisture, there isn't as much of a profound effect on the flavor of the cheese and they can be in these conditions for a longer period of time. After we've done our sensory evaluation, we move on to the books. And uh, uh, I am uh, lucky to have a very good library here in my house. I've been doing, uh, this craft, this profession for a long time. And, and I, I love history and I love the history of cheese making and cheese aging and I love to read the stories. So uh, I would encourage you all to, uh, to start to accumulate some books, particularly books that have stories in them about how the cheeses are made and aged, uh, some history about the types of uh, breeds of the animals, the cows, goats, the sheep that were used to, to make the, cheap, the milk for the cheeses, to get a good sense of what, uh, of what the milk is to start with. You know, is it a high fat milk? Is it an average fat? Is it a protein fat ratio that's real low or is it more closer to one? Or, you know, what kinds of feeds typically went into these cheeses and are they still being used, you know, to produce them or have things changed so that when you go to the market and Get, a, get that cheese that you, you want to make, you have a better idea of, of how to start. So we look at these different points, you know, where, where was the cheese first made? What, what was it like there? What, was it mountainous? Was it a coastal area? Was it a hot climate? Was it more like Vermont where it gets real cold in the winter and not so hot in the summer? Uh, things like that. I know from having worked in the Balkans, like Greece and Macedonia and across Turkey and into Armenia and Georgia, that they had this uh, interesting continental type climate where it's, uh, it's, it's a little chilly in the winter and they get their snow uh, and because they're mountainous places. But in the summer, it's quite hot. You know, it's not like here in Vermont. And the, the feed is up in the mountains and that's where they take the animals for grazing and they make the cheeses up in the mountains on pasture grass. And um, up there it's relatively cool so they can dig 
caves or you know cellars into the mountainsides and age the cheese there and um and then uh they can move it down to the villages for the winter time but they're trying to avoid at all costs all that heat and that you know that, that could cause the cheese to uh to ripen in, a, in the wrong direction but those the cheeses in that part of the world tend to be a lot saltier than the cheeses that we make here in the u.s Why did the people make this cheese? What was their, what, did they have to make a, uh, were they pretty happy making little rounds of cheese that aged a short time because they were very close to markets and didn't get buried in snow in the winter? Or was that why, you know, the being snowbound and, and, you know, being hard to get out in the winter, was that why they developed these bigger wheels? Or like in Italy with the Parmigiano, why is that cheese so big, you know? Well, did they look at it as a way of storing milk and then not having to sell the cheese right away? You know, more like having a bank uh, uh, for the economy or something like that. That stuff is interesting. Um, and, and on and on and on, just, uh, just, you know, going through and trying to understand the origin of the cheese, I think. It's a good exercise, even if it's not going to give you uh, relevant information to to your situation it's still a good exercise to understand the history of the cheese that, that you really want to make um and you know even if it's a cheese that that someone has recently made like here in the states american cheesemakers tend to make all different kinds of cheese they just don't focus on alpine styles or bloomy rind styles or this or that and the other thing in their business that's more the rarity they tend to make a, a, a handful of, of varieties and that covers a spectrum. So, uh, so that's uh, an important thing then to, uh, to know that, well, you know, that this isn't where the cheese originated. Maybe I should take a look at where it actually came from way back in time. And really important thing is how old is the cheese um, when it's usually eaten. And that's, that's a really important thing to know because you want to really nail that so that you're getting your cheese to the market at the appropriate time so that it's the cheese that tastes similar to what you enjoy or what you think people you know, in the market are going to enjoy. And that might be the reason you're trying to develop a new cheese too. So you need to really get a sense of that and the cheesemongers can help you out with that one as well. And then uh, I'm thinking about the milk. There, there are some cultures uh, here. One of the companies that, that we uh, tend to buy cultures from, it's called Danisco, and their line is called Choose It, C-H-O-O-Z-I-T. And they, back in the uh, 90s, they began to develop these uh, cultures that were blends of mesophilic and thermophilic bacteria that were created to assist in making cheeses with old world flavors. So for example, there's a che uh, culture called Kazu, K-A-Z-U, which is a uh, acronym for uh, cheese culture in Dutch. And so that is a very good culture for making Gouda. The MA4001 culture, for example, was developed uh, for people who made Tom style cheese. Now it's become a cheese that's known as the farmhouse culture and can be used for lots of different cheeses, but originally the idea was to come up with a culture that could be used to, to make tom cheeses that are so important in France, and they make them all over the country in mountainous areas. And finally, there's a culture called MT1, which was developed to, to be useful in making uh, Greek feta, so real Balkan-style feta to promote the classic flavor of, of the feta cheese from its origins. And those cultures were based on what microbes would have been in the milk, what microbes survived and then did their job in developing the flavor in the cheese by producing enzymes. Hopefully in the books you've got, you'll find recipes. And this is the, what I really like. Even just a story of you know, a good observer writing down you know what the cheesemaker was doing it may not tell you what kind of starter culture they were using or, or if they used one at all uh that would be a, a nice little tidbit if if he mentioned that they didn't put in a starter then you would know well, well they're re really relying on the raw milk microflora 
to express themselves later on. And uh, maybe the milk that they were using was very fresh so that all the bacteria were surviving and not being uh, dying off by being stored in the cold. So this is a very, very important to dig up stories and even recipes, more detailed descriptions. Uh, and like there's some books out there that, that uh, I find useful, like Cheese Making Practice by uh, an author named Scott. And in the back, there's a, a really good a number of recipes. And he was very accurate in detailing um, how the cheeses were made. It's good to have several sources because so you can compare the recipes for accuracy rather than just counting on one. And uh, I remember when I started to develop uh, Asiago type cheese for my own business, I found a real consistency in the recipe. I had four different sources and I found a real consistency during the time in the vat when they were describing how the curds were cooked in the whey. And that, that really solidified the way that I make it because I saw this, uh, these uh, um, were doing the same thing even though different authors were, were writing about the way it was made. Really get a good uh, sense of the aging conditions and, and any window into the techniques they're using, like salt solutions, temperature, humidity, how many time, times a week they flip the cheeses and rub them, that kind of stuff. That can be really helpful to, to the rind development. And any clues about skimming cream are, are really useful because that could really help you uh, make a better version of the cheese that, that you really want to make and rather than using a, a full fat milk, you know, and getting a soft texture and maybe not good eye development and, and, uh, and then the flavors and developing in the same way. It could just be about the fact that you, their milk has too much fat in it. And then the vice versa, when uh, the, the cheese isn't rich enough, it could mean that you're using a, a milk that doesn't have enough fat in it. So you could even be adding cream into milk to, to fortify it and, and lower that ratio of protein to fat to make the right kind of cheese. On the flip side of standardization, we're really just talking about cow milk. Uh, when we're talking about standardizing, it's not that necessary to do that with goat, sheep and goat milk because um, the, uh, the milks themselves can make a wide variety of cheeses from soft lactic to soft ripened to tomes to hard Sardinian styles. There's Romano, sheep milk Romano, goat milk Romano. And it really comes in the recipe because because the milks um, uh, have these levels of fatty acids that are quite different from, uh, from uh, cow milk, then you get the typical flavor, but also because of the way the um, proteins are structured and, the, um, and how the, the, when you cut curd and how whey it drains out of the curd and things like that, you can really work with the recipe more to create harder and softer cheeses versus having to remove fat to do that. The fat globules in these milks are very small, so they get dispersed more evenly throughout the matrix of the cheese curd, and therefore uh, they will tend to dry down more rapidly and uh, get to that more granular type uh, texture and then that you you're shooting for when you're making a Sardinian style cheese, for example. Sheep milk is pretty hard to turn into soft ripened cheese. Uh, it's, uh, it, the whey drains out very fast and it's hard to, uh, to get at that high moisture. Um, oftentimes people have more success when they blend in some cow milk or some goat milk to, to raise the moisture content. But you know, uh, you can uh, you can do the best you can. Now, I know there's some great sheep milk cheeses out there that are relatively soft, but they're they're not aged for a very long time. Like a cheese like Parai, which is a cheese made in the region where the Roquefort is made, is a soft geotricum rind cheese that's just a few weeks old when it's eaten. So that's really uh, what you're trying to shoot for when you're using sheep milk. Um, like, uh, you know, one of the things I always think about is uh, Manchego cheese, which 
which uh, I'll, I'll be at my farmer's market stand with my cheeses and, and someone will, and you know, uh, pretty well advertised and I, they're all made from cow milk and so inevitably someone will ask me if I make, have a manchego, it's their favorite cheese. And just, you know, you have to use sheep milk to make manchego. That's, uh, that's part of the, the um, identity of that cheese. And of course, the flavor is influenced greatly by doing these blended milk cheeses. You can really steer the flavor in different directions. And I remember doing a reverse engineering of a cheese recently called La Tour, which is a soft Giotricum rind Italian cheese. It's sold in a little plastic container. It's so soft it has to be in a little container. Um, it is made from all three milks, cow, sheep, and goat. And as we're working with, I was working with the group, and we're all like tasting it and trying to tease out, I wonder what the percentage of cow milk and goat milk and sheep milk was in this, in the blend they used. That was kind of interesting. Peter, I'm just yeah. going to ask you to keep an eye on the time because yeah, we've only I, got about another 15 minutes. Right, I got it. I'm, I'm there. I'm there. And so finally, you know, for research, uh, we want to do some interviews. I've been talking about this already, and this could be very helpful, you know, going to the region where the cheese is made, and talking to a cheesemonger who really knows the cheese well will be very, very helpful. So we go, we finally got all our information and we've taken a bunch of notes and we go to start to develop the recipe. We're gonna go through all these different uh, steps in the process of making the cheese. And I'm, I'm gonna now go through them uh, pretty quickly because you guys have this presentation and this will be a good template for you to use when you go out and do this on your own. So the milk type of pr pr uh, production I feel is critical to the recipe. Um, it, uh, it, it's just often the case that cheesemakers will go and try to make a cheese without good understanding of, of what type of milk went into uh, making the cheese and they, they never really come up with a uh, what I would say is a um, good representation of, of that cheese. So just remember that, that in some cases, particularly with, uh, with these hard alpine cheeses, they've got rules of production and they uh, are not working with milk that's more than uh, from the previous evening. You know, the milk, the cheese is made every day and the milk is, is only stored from the evening and then the morning and evening milks are picked up together and cheese is made. That's a very short time. So uh, that could be an important point. Now we, we need to figure out what kind of starter culture would go into making a cheese. Um, when you're making raw milk cheeses, oftentimes you are going to get open texture, you're going to get uh, flavors coming from the raw milk, uh, carbon dioxide production coming from the raw milk, and you, you may not have to use the same cultures that you would use when you're, you're using pasteurized milk, where you've removed all the, the um, important microbes that would be for fermenting and, and producing enzymes for aging the cheese have been removed. So you're going to have to figure out what to add to produce that cheese if you're from pasteurized milk. So they're very different approaches. And I think with raw milk cheese, it's a lot more important to understand the actual milk that was traditionally used for making the cheese versus uh, um, trying, you know, trying to add in all these cultures to produce the, 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 the same um, characteristics. When we're, we're, we're looking at what kinds of cultures may be used, then uh, it's really important to understand the temperatures because if we're, uh, if we're going over 104, like 40 Celsius, 104 degrees Fahrenheit, we're, we can't be using a mesophilic culture. It, it won't survive. So we need to, to, you know, if we see that in the recipe, then we're going to be looking at thermophilic cultures to use. Um, and then to develop the rind on the cheese. Uh, washed rind cheeses, bloomy rind cheeses, those kinds of tongs, different things like that to uh, 
to just uh, get a sense of what could be added to the VAT at this time to then promote Rhine development. What type of rendered is used? I was referring to this earlier in the century evaluation when we get more of that picante flavor. Sometimes the only way to get at that flavor is through using a paste rennet rather than a liquid animal rennet. Uh, and uh, even using light paste powder versus a, a, a paste rennet uh, may not, not be good enough. It, it may be difficult to find out the amount of light paste to use to promote that flavor, although it can be done, so that could be a challenge for you. Then we're looking at coagulation times, and of course, we want to have shorter coagulations to make hard cheeses so that when we start to cut the curd, more whey will flow out of the curds versus letting the curd get really firm for a soft cheese so that when we cut it, not as much whey goes out of it. And then the size of the, the, the curds, of course, and that should say cut curd into very small pieces, not curd curd. Versus ladling the curd out to keep a lot more moisture in for a soft ripened cheese. We've got still in the vat, trying to get a sense of, uh, of how firm the curds are. This would be where it'd be really good to work with a cheese maker, uh, or at least watch what they're doing because many times with the hard cheeses, they, they've got this uh, thing they call the grip where they pick out some curd out of the vat and squeeze it and then and, and use their senses to evaluate if the curd's ready and if it's been cooked enough. And that's kind of a hard thing to figure out if you've never done it before. Uh, and then if we're curd, washing the curd in the vat by removing whey and adding water, you know, we, it can be anywhere from a small amount to a, a third of the original milk volume and that greatly affects the texture of the cheese. Once we settle the curds, how long will they be under the whey? How much knitting are we going to allow? When we drain the whey, it's a big step. It's very, very important. So we need to have an understanding of what the acidity should be down there at the bottom. The pH at drain is very important. The lower pH values, meaning higher acidity, create cheeses with more crumbly and uh, flaky texture versus the opposite will create cheeses that are more supple and uh, elastic. And um, yeah, so, so that's good for there. Then we've got curd handling, which, which encompasses quite a, a few things, and that's uh, removing that curd from the vat. It could be curd that's broken up and, and the whey drained off very well to create a lot of mechanical openings for like a blue cheese. It could be slabs of, of curd that are milled up, like for making cheddar or some types of blues like Stilton. Um, you know, it could be uh, curds mixed with lots of whey, curds mixed with a little whey, curds knit under the whey, pre-pressed under the whey. All of these things would, would uh, influence what kind of texture that cheese is going to have. Then we've got the steps during on the drain table of turning the wheels, maybe pressing them. And that's when the curd knitting is happening, the, the actual texture of the cheese is forming and it's fermenting still by acidification of the sugars and the lactic acid. And finally, when we get to the where all that's the way we want, we move on to salting and cooling the cheese down. I think salt is really important in uh, cheese making. And uh, I think choice of salt is very important. Of course, choice of the granularity of the salt is important because if you're trying to do the technique like in the middle picture where you, you're doing an alpine type cheese and you're not, you're not brining that cheese, you're just using a little bit of salt sprinkled on the surface and you're allowing that to, uh, to sort of dissolve over a day and then the next day you're rubbing it in and then the day after you're gonna flip the wheel over and do the same thing all over again. You can't use salt that's too fine of a flake of a granularity or it'll just dissolve too quickly and it'll never start to develop the smear on the rind. So if you wanna make a smeared rind cheese like a Gruyere, you're gonna to have to make sure you get the right kind of salt. That's just an example um, of, of how salt is so important. 
then we've got the majority of, of making a cheese ready for market is, uh, is the aging, the affinage. And this is, uh, again, could really help out if you can get some good stories and, uh, out of books or accounts of, of people who do blogging nowadays, who've been to places and have written down what they were observing. That could be really helpful. Talking to other cheesemakers, cheesemongers who have been out in the field selecting cheeses for their shops and who've had contact with the offiners because, you know, that's where all this happens in the cheese cellars, the caves, how much rind drying is done before the cheeses move into the, the humid uh, caves. What are the conditions in the caves? Is there a warm room treatment where they're developing a certain amount of eyes to create the open texture in the cheese? And then finally, as I, I, I was talking about earlier, all these techniques to create the look of the rinds. And uh, for example, down here in the bottom photo, some of the cheeses we make, the Cacio Cavallo type cheeses. And you can see when they come out of the caves on the right, they're covered with kind of bluish and grayish mold. But then our, our uh, way of, of, of getting the cheeses ready for market are then running cool water over this and scrubbing all that off with a stiff brush to create the cheese that's in the center of the picture. And that's, you know, what I saw in the shops. They, they're they very clean looking cheeses. And, uh, and that's, uh, I was fortunate enough to have had the experience of making cheese like this in Macedonia. And I got to see firsthand that this is how they did it. So uh, once I saw that, I, I was able to make the right look. And of course, if we want to, if we want to, um, uh, have a cheese that can age for a really long time, a good strategy is to drop the temperature. And then uh, that will hasten the, the development of the more savory flavors, the stronger flavors coming from the breakdown of protein. And it'll sort of, sort of uh, promote more of the light politic activity um, that will give us more of those tropical fruit flavors. But ultimately, any cheese that sits in a, a cave for a long time at 50 degrees is going to get some some a uh, little bit of that tingling uh, feeling on your tongue. So the cheese I used as as an example here, and um, to to do the reverse engineering was a famous Gruyere cheese that's made in this one canton, Fribourg in uh, in um, Switzerland. And so when I I tried the cheese for the first time, uh, I, uh, I noticed these things about it, and um, I got to try a couple of different versions, and so those were my flavor notes there. And then as I, as I was looking at the Rhine, I made sure I looked at these Gruyere's in different shops, and you know, it took me a while to get a sense of, of really what um, the Gruyere, this Gruyere was all about. And then I um, started reading up, I went on the internet, I looked in my different books, and I found out all these things about it. I found a really important thing on the bottom, like the typical size and weight of the cheese. And then uh, this is a very special cheese. It's not made year round. It's made uh, exclusively, uh, uh, or well, it can be made year round, excuse me, but it's also got the Alpage version, which is only made in the chalets in the traditional way. So uh, this is a really, uh, exclusive type cheese and it's a raw milk cheese and it's based on uh, forage to make milk that is not fermented. So when I, I, I was looking at the recipes and I had several sources, I found these things in common. And I, I realized that, that they actually, many of the cheese makers uh, used homemade rennet preparations. So I had to learn, figure out how to do that. And I found a book that I actually had a recipe for that. And you can find this out on the internet too, but it really, uh, and I did this last summer to, uh, to make uh, some cheese. And it's, and it's really interesting to have to go through the process of making your own rennet. And you get two in one, you get both a starter culture that contains lactobacilli and streptococcus thermophilus and the rennet enzyme all in this 
preparation and you add that to the vat. And it's a pretty fast process actually to make this cheese. So even though you're cooking it up to a high temperature, um, it, is, uh, it is done in a relatively short time. And, and you know, on through the rest of the recipe, there's the, the pressing and then some of the cheese makers did brining and some didn't and some combined the two. Uh, or they always combined the two or just dry salted the cheese. And then the conditions that it aged in were really important because the milk quality was so good in these cheeses. These were like the premier cheeses that were selected for this brand and they could age them at, at higher temperatures typically. But anything that didn't meet the, the standards um, that had more uh, risks maybe of developing carbon dioxide, they would age at a lower temperature. So what I found out about the milk was it was always grass-based on native pastures. They fed dry hay in the winter period. Uh, they, uh, they had lower producing cows typically, the Montbillards and other breeds up there in the Alps. And they always did a skimming to lower the protein, to raise the protein fat ratio to where the protein and fat were equal or the protein was a little higher than the fat. Very fresh milk. And then uh, a special thing about storing milk, which now we can't always do that if we're not in Switzerland. Storing the milk uh, overnight here in the States, it has to be below 45. However, if you add a little bit of, of mesophilic starter culture to the milk, you could be what's called pre-ripening the milk and it would have very little effect on the, uh, the flavor of the cheese down the road because of the cooking process would eliminate that. But even storing it at 50 degrees overnight, hardly any growth would occur. And that would be a way to do this recipe and follow the traditional method. So when I, this is the, the final part of the presentation right now, I'm about to end a lot of time for your questions is just my own recipe that I developed out of doing the reverse engineering. So this is the way I would approach making this cheese. And uh, the cultures that I mentioned here, for starter, those are the Choose It brand that I was talking about earlier, made by Danisco. So I'm just, I'm not gonna explain this, I'm just gonna leave this for you to have a part of the presentation. And now I'm gonna open it up to questions. Right, um, Jeff there has asked, um, are you able to provide some examples of good literature at the end of your talk? Um, Peter, I wonder if you might email some things through to me and I can pass them oh, on sure. to people. I'll, Is I'll, that all right? I'll email a bibliography um, yeah. for, uh, for the reverse engineering of the Gruyere and yes. then I'll also put in some of my favourite books. Terrific, that'll be great. So Jeff, I hope that helps you. So I'm sorry, if anybody has to leave um, and you do have questions, you're welcome to email the questions through to me and I'll pass them on to Peter. Or, and he has got, um, you got an email address there? But um, I would like you to CC me in, on the email in your initial consultation with Peter. Okay, Graham has asked, hi Peter, looking at some blue vein recipes, some add dry salt to curds before hooping. Why is this? I think this is because blue mold uh, expresses itself best when you've got an even amount of salt through the cheese. You get uh, the veining occurring more evenly versus uh, when you do a, a blue cheese that you would brine it or salt it on the outside to get the salt coming through. Um, so, so this way they can, uh, they can needle the cheese earlier when they've done this technique. Right. So I'm not sure if we have got, oh, here we go. Claire has asked, how will the pH of way of way at draining affect the texture of the cheese? When the pH is higher, let's say uh, typically 6.40 to 6.50 is a typical high pH of drain. You're going to get cheeses that the body is more elastic. Uh, it's going to promote uh, gas development better if you're shooting for that. 
uh, the cheeses will have more stuffiness versus when you're thinking about cheddar cheese, the, the pH we drain here in Vermont is 6.15. And that, you know, is a, is a really good way to create cheddar cheese because you're going to get the, the body characteristics are more flaky. You know, they're, they're not going to have a stretch. So it's a difference between flaky texture versus stretchy texture, really. And the range is, is anywhere from like about 6.0 uh, would be a real low one up to about 6.50 for a high one. Okay. So Claire's also asked um, if we're making mozzarella cheese, would 6.4 to 6.5 be most appropriate? For draining the whey. Uh, no, I would not be draining at that high of a pH because then your, your curds are going to dry out as they have to sit around and acidify down to pH 5.30 or less, which is where you can chop it up and stretch it. So I like to get it down to about the same as cheddar, 6.15 or it depends on the size batch I'm making and how long it takes to drain the whey off, but it would be anywhere from about 6.15 to even down to 5.90, uh, which is the way I do it here on a typical batch. I make uh, more like a hard provolone. It's not really a mozzarella. And so I will go down to about 6.0 on my drain for that. Okay. Right. Can you suggest? Jeff has asked, yeah. Can you suggest some possible causes of excess gas production in cheddar cheese from two to four two months? Two to four months. So that's what's known as late gas development, which occurs after three weeks. And uh, I see it mostly after a month. And this, uh, to me, you got two things that could be driving this. One would be the cheddar curds themselves weren't acidic enough before you threw the salt on and pressed them into your, your rounds or your blocks. And that would, uh, would be pretty obvious in the texture too. It just wouldn't have that, uh, that same uh, you know, flakiness that cheddar cheese has. It'd be much more like a Gouda texture. So that could promote gas production, but more importantly would be the feed that went into producing the milk because I've made a lot of cheddar here in Vermont and I made it on a farm where the cows were fed. Uh, they were on pastures for, for the six months we have of grazing, but they were also fed wrapped fermented grass bales in the, the non-grazing time. And we always had a certain amount of cheddar that, um, that got kind of gassy where when we went to cut up the blocks, it would be more crumbly and harder to work with. And a bit of that butyric acid flavor, that kind of tingly mouthfeel would occur as well. And that's, when I think of gas, gassy cheddar, that's what I think of. And that's more related to feed. Whereas if you're just getting like gas bubbles in your cheddar, then that was, is probably due to not enough acid development. A mozzarella or bocconcini will over salting affect elasticity. Yeah, it, cause it's gonna dry the cheese out. Um, and you know, it won't remain as supple. Uh, as it would if, if it had the right amount of salt. Yeah, the mozzarella and bocconcini, they're really very low salt cheeses. And the Italian tradition is to put it in a brine just for a short time. So you got the salty flavor on the outside and the milky flavor on the inside. And it's supposed to be eaten fresh, so it never really gets hanging, hanging around long enough for the salt to make it to the center. 